Good morning, everybody. We are ready to start today. I had the pleasure again to present PhD Ahmed. He will give today a lecture, Control of Under Aspecting Mechanical System from Challenge and Consumption Solution. Now I leave the microphone to PhD Ahmed. Thank you very much. And, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos días. <laughs> okay. I should learn, I should learn uh, some words at least. <laughs> so uh, today the presentation will uh, concern a class of some systems in robotics. So this class is called, uh, it's named Interactuate Mechanical Systems or Interactuate Robotic Systems, it's the same. So uh, the idea is to interest it in control of such systems. So the same as the previous presentations, uh, the heart of the presentation concerns the control. So the idea is to design controllers for such systems. And also like the previous presentations, before I present the proposed control solutions and the real-time experiments and how it works, the first thing is to know if to, uh, to situate the challenges of control of such systems and why we are interested in control of such systems. So this is necessary. And before presenting also the challenges, the first step is to define first what is an underactuated mechanical system. So all this will be in uh, the lecture of today. So since I think it's the same audience as the previous days, I will try to go very fast uh, the first presentation of my lab, situated in Montpellier. We have two institutions, the University of Montpellier and the National Cent Center for Research Council. CNRS, uh, uh, and okay, here I add just this uh, video to show you our university. In the previous presentations, I didn't put it, so I just to give you an overview. So our university is situated in Montpellier, in the south of France. Uh, here, for instance, you can see some of the faculties of that university. And we have, it's the University of Technology, so we have different uh, fields of research. It's a university with a huge number of foreign students that come in from all over the world, from different countries. And we have also a very high spectrum of research fields, like here, as you can see, robotics. This is our robot that I have presented during the, the lecture concerning underwater vehicles. This is medical robotics. So it's the teleoperation for surgical robotics, for instance and so on. So the university is uh, very attractive and it's one of the best universities in France. It's a very big university since initially we had three universities in Montpellier called the University of Montpellier 1, no, no, University of Montpellier 2 and the University of Montpellier 3. And then the University of Montpellier 1 and Montpellier 2 merged together to create this university. This is like two universities together. And you can see uh, some places at the university, some spaces here for the students, and uh, many things. And the research fields also, as I said, is very, very, the spectrum is very large. So we have uh, many uh, specialities or many fields of research, uh, as you can see on, on these illustrated videos. And also you can see some places where the students uh, are, the, for instance, the the, the classrooms, the, the space for the students at the university, the, here for instance it's uh, the field of medicine, surgical robotics for instance, or surgery, medicine, dentist, we have many, many uh, fields of research at this university. And also it is very attractive, sorry the text is in French but you can understand, attractivity, it's attractivity, <laughs> so it's the same as in English or The fields of chemistry, of biology, of all this we have this at uh, our university. We have mechanical design. Here as you can see some tasks of welding. Forty-five thousand students. So the number of students that you see is forty-five thousand. 
and 75 starters, labs of research, 77. And here it's the city center of Montpellier. Nice. Okay, this is just to give you an overview about the university. I go through uh, this slide that represents the different research teams in the Department of Robotics in our laboratory. Here in this slide I show some of the experimental platforms that we have in our lab. And actually this presentation I try to focus on this kind of systems and their actuated mechanical systems. And regarding my research activities, as I said it, during the previous uh, lectures, I have four or five main applications, and today we will try to focus the presentation on this application, so it's the underactuated mechanical systems. And now we arrive to the outline of the presentation. So the outline of the presentation, as you can see here, we have different points. I will start with a general introduction, then I will start uh, the, pro the contact and problem formulation, where I will introduce the problem of control of underactuated mechanical systems. So we will give a definition of what is an underactuated mechanical system and why we are interested in controlling of such systems. Then I will try to present two problems regarding to the control of these systems. The first problem is the problem of stabilization. So I will explain what is stabilization. And the second problem is the problem of limit cycle generation. So what is also limit cycle generation? And for both problems, I will talk about the control problem formulation I will introduce the proposed solutions and I will focus more on either simulation and real-time experiments or just real-time experiments uh, for the case of stabilization and I will try to conclude at the end. Nice, so now to start. To start the beginning, I will try to focus something which is very important regarding robotics. So today, as you know, robotics is a very, very rich uh, domain of research with different topics. And we can find, for instance, in industrial robotics, we can find medical robotics, we can find humanoid robotics, we can find underwater robotics or marine robotics, we can find uh, parallel robotics, we can find mobile robotics, we can find uh, micro robotics. It's also a very interesting research field. As you can see here inside blood, we can put very, very small robots inside the body of the human to do something. Uh, we have aerial vehicles, we have uh, bio-inspired robotics, we have also uh, this field which is very, very interesting. I will talk about this tomorrow. So this field is the rehabilitation or assistive robotics and we have service robotics to help the elderly persons and so on. So the, the, the robotics, the domain is very, very rich. Now, all this, for all these applications, so we design robots. So we have different kinds of robots. It can be, this is a robot, this is a robot, this is a robot, and so on. All these, they are robots. Now, if we look to these robots, they are characterized by many things. One of the things is the number of actuators. So you, when you design a robot, you have to decide in the, in the, in the design stage about the number of actuators. How, how much actuators you will put inside your robot. So this is very interesting, and also you try to, deci to decide about the mobility. So your robot will have two degrees of freedom, or three, or four, or six, or more, or less. So all these things are related to whatever your kind of robot, so you are interested to define these two things, the number of degrees of freedom, the mobility of the robot, and the number of actuators. Now, starting from this introduction, I will introduce now the underactuated mechanical systems or underactuated robots. And this underactuation is closely related to this definition of degrees of freedom and control input or actuators. It's exactly related to this. So let me now introduce the problem formulation of underactuated mechanical systems. And I try to show here three examples. And the three examples are this first one. It's a, it's a manipulator, R which has six degrees of freedom, so it has six joints. All the joints are rotational, so it's a pure rotation. And the robot is equipped with six actuators. So it means that at each joint you have a motor, you have an actuator. So this kind of robot, if your robot has a number of degrees of freedom equal to the number of the control input or equal to the number of actuators or motors, so we say 
that the robot or the system is fully actuated. This is very easy. Now, we have another case. You can have, so this is, the, if you want, the middle, but you can have two cases from, from both sides. From the first side, if you have, imagine that you have this second example, the robot has two rotations. So it's something like that. This is a rotation, and here a rotation. But you put just one motor. And the motor here, this is the case of a robot, the motor is here. And here there is no motor. So this robot has, so in this case, one motor and two degrees of freedom. So it means that the number of the control actions or the actuators is less than the degrees of freedom. And this system is called under actuated. Now we can have the inverse. We can have some cases where the number of actuators is greater than the number of degrees of freedom. And this kind of robot, it's here. I have this example with seven actuators and six degrees of freedom. And we say that the robot is redundant. But we can call it also, since here it's under actuated, here it should be over actuated. So redundant, if you read in a document, and overactuated or uh, redundant, it's exactly the same thing. So in my case, on, in, in this lecture, we are interested in these kind of systems. Now you know the definition, an underactuated system or an underactuated robot, it's a system which has less motor or less actuator than the grid of freedom. This is very easy. Let's go further. And actually, we show you some examples, four examples. Look to this example. The example here, it's an example of the acrobot, so it has two degrees of freedom, but pay attention, we have here a joint which is actuated, and here, no actuator. So it means we try to move this one to be able to do the swing up control of the robot. Using one actuator, you try to control two degrees of freedom, because you have one rotation here, without motor, and one rotation here with a motor. So we try using one motor, control two degrees of freedom. And it's not so easy, huh? pay attention, because if uh, you are in the case of the fully actuated systems, so you have one motor here, one motor here, it's easy. It's very easy, you control each motor, and you do your motion, it's finished. But now if you have two degrees of freedom, and just one actuator, so it's too difficult. So this is one example. Let me show you other examples. I will show you four examples. This is the first one. And now the second example. The second example, it's, uh, you, you know the inverted pendulum. The inverted pendulum is here, but pay attention, this one, it has one, two, three. So it's triple inverted pendulum. So it has one joint, two joints, three joints, and we have the, the cart, this cart that can move. So we have four degrees of freedom, and you have one actuator. So how we can control the four degrees of freedom using just one actuator. And the actuator, it's here in this cart that can move. Here you can, they can pair with and without control and you can see the difference. And here in a slow motion, look here with the control, it stabilizes quickly. And without control, as you can see here, the behavior. So it's a very complex behavior because we have no control input in this case. So four degrees of freedom and only one actuator, so it is underactuated. So this is the second example. Let me introduce two other examples. The third one. Third one is different, it's not a manipulator, so it's uh, an airplane. I don't know if you know this kind of airplane. As you can see, the airplane is landing vertically. So as you can see, this is the propellers and this is uh, the motion uh, direction, so actually, they control these propellers, okay, and the, and the airplane is landing. So this is what we call PVTOL. It's coming from Planner Vertical Takeoff and Landing Aircraft. So it's an aircraft that will take off and land vertically, and then it turns the propellers to move in this direction. So this kind of system, if you want to look to its dynamics in the plane, it can, be such, uh, it can be represented by this picture. So the dynamics of the airplane in, the, in, in this plane, it has three degrees of freedom, which are the center of mass, so x and y, and we have this angle of orientation. So we have three degrees of freedom, and it has only two control inputs, 
and the two control bits which are the propellers that push the, the, the airplane in this direction, for instance, and you can change the orientation of the propellers. And the second control input is the control of the orientation. So we have two control inputs and three degrees of freedom, and the system is under actuation. So this is the third example. Now let me show a last example. The last example is this one. This, it's called the cube link. So it's a cube, a cube with three inertia wheels inside. And we try to control this, the all degrees of freedom using this inertia wheel. As you can see here, they introduce the disturbance. Here they can control the orientation. They create this rotation around the vertical. And they can put it on one edge and so on. So if you to understand, let's see just this simple example, which is just two degrees of freedom. So it's, the, it's not the cube, but a part of the cube, just one, two degrees of freedom in the plane. So we have the inertia wheel. We, it's a joint which is actuated. And here there is no actuator. So it's a passive joint. So we have two degrees of freedom and one actuator for 2D. Now if you go to the cube, so we have, you multiply by three. So you will have six degrees of freedom and three actuators. And also it is an under actuated mechanical system. So through these examples, just for you to understand what is an under actuated mechanical system and why it is difficult to control all these kinds of systems. Now let's go further in the theory of these systems. Why they are interesting to be controlled? First of all, so the definition you know now, it's uh, systems with less actuators than degrees of freedom. Now, from where the under actuation is coming? So there is two sources of under actuation. So the first one, as you can see here, it can be during the design stage, you decide to reduce the number of actuators. It means what? You design the robot, and it ha you know at the beginning that he, the robot has four degrees of freedom, but you decide to put only two actuators, for instance. Why? The reasons are here. If you want to reduce the cost, if you remove one actuator, you reduce the cost. If you want to reduce the weight, the weight of the robot, you remove one actuator, you reduce the weight. Or if, can you, if you want to reduce the consumption, the energy consumption, you remove one actuator. So one of these reasons, you obtain an under-actuated mechanical system, and it is uh, coming from the design stage. So it's intentional under-actuation. However, we have another also case of under-actuation, and this is the case coming from intentional under-actuation, and I illustrate this through this example. This example it represents a satellite. So a satellite, it's a system that turns in an orbit, and this system, or the satellite, has three actuators, three motors. The three motors, they control three reaction wheels to control the three degrees of freedom of the satellite. So roll, pitch, and yaw. So the three angles of the satellite are controlled by three motors that can rotate the reaction wheels. Now imagine that you put your satellite on the orbit, and the satellite is working, and after six months, one of the actuators will become deficient. So after the deficiency of one actuator, here we have a system with three degrees of freedom and three actuators. It becomes a system with three degrees of freedom and only two control inputs. So it becomes under actuated. So this case also is very interesting to study. And the idea now is how we can find a solution to control the system with less actuators or less motors. And the consequence of the under actuation in all these systems is the following. First of all, we have, if you write the mathematical model of the system, so you have a very high coupling between the actuated and non-actuated degrees of freedom. So there is a coupling between them. So you cannot say, I will control the actuated and I leave the unactuated. But the unactuated are not, they are not uh, stable. They can go away, they can be unstable and so on. So it's not a good solution to say that I will control just the actuated and I don't care about, no, it's false. So we have to care about both of them. So this is the first point, and the second point, it's uh, in automatic control, we call this kind of systems non-minimum phase systems. What is a non-minimum phase system? So it's a system which is, we can find non-minimum phase systems in linear systems and non-linear systems. In linear systems, it's a system which have 
You have seen the automatic control. What is the nominal phase linear system? If you look to a system, a linear system, a transfer function, when the system is stable, you look to the denominator and you have to find roots with negative values. So the real part of the root should be strictly negative to say that the system is stable. Now, non-minimum. Non-minimum phase, it's very easy. It's a transfer function also, and you don't see the denominator. You see the numerator of the transfer function. So if the numerator has roots with positive values, you say that the system is non-minimum phase. So this is linear system. Now in the linear system, the nominal phase concept is the following. Since you have some degrees of freedom actuated and the others are not actuated, if you choose a control input for the actuated part and you apply any controller, any nonlinear controller, so you obtain what? You try to linearize system, you can have a linear part only and you still have a nonlinear part. And the problem is the nonlinear part, the nonlinear part that's still nonlinear, you cannot linearize it because you not you have not enough control inputs. This part is mainly unstable. If it is unstable, we say that the system is non-minimum phase. And it's very, very difficult to control such system. Because the linear part, the linearized part, if you can control it, but the steel part is unstable, what you can do in this case to stabilize it. And it's important to stabilize both linear linearized part and nonlinear part. So this is what we call the non-minimum phase uh, topic or uh, feature. Now let me show you some examples. Uh, we have seen some examples in the videos. I can introduce some examples like this one. We have seen the first video, it's the Acrobot. So we have one actuator here, and here we have no actuator. And the idea is to control both using one actuator. Then you have this one that you have seen on the video also, this airplane. We have the case of flexible arms. Sometimes we design uh, robotic manipulators, but they are flexible. The idea of a flexible arm it means that the limbs are not rigid, they are flexible. The fact that they are flexible, you need to add more degrees of freedom to model this flexibility. So the number of control inputs, they stay the same here, for instance, two, but if you want to model the flexibility, you have to add more degrees of freedom in the motion. So you will have more degrees of freedom than control inputs. We have the example of some working robots like this one, also some biped robots or working robots we can find and are actuated. We have the case of underwater vehicles. Here, for instance, this case, we have four of, um, six propellers, six control inputs, but we can control only five degrees of freedom, so it's interactuated. And also surf vehicles. These boats, you know, they are not fully actuated. They are interactuated, why? Because the boat, though it has x, y, and the angle, but it has only two control inputs. So we can control the speed, and you can control what? And the rotation, this angle. But you cannot control <coughs> the three degrees of freedom. So it is also and actuated, and so on. See, this is just some, ex some examples to understand that the underactuated mechanical systems or robotic systems, they are present in many, many domains in robotics. Now, in our case, so we are interested to design some controllers for this kind of underactuated mechanical systems, and our system is the following. It's this one. It's like the cube, -ly, the cube with three inertia wheels, but here it's in 2D, so we have just two degrees of freedom, and the reaction wheel. And it's an inverted pendulum, so we call it inertia wheel inverted pendulum. So the classical inverted pendulum, you have a car that can move, and then we have this, uh, this beam that you want to control in the vertical position. Here it's different. Yeah, we, we have not a car that can move, we have an inertia wheel, a reaction wheel. We have this wheel that can be controlled, it can rotate. And the base does not move. And in the base, we have a passive joint, so there is no actuator. So we have two degrees of freedom and one actuator, and the system is underactuated. Now, the idea of using inertia wheel, reaction wheel, it's not new, so it's very old. Let me show you, let me show you some examples. Look to this example, the date is 1914. So it is a car with two wheels, and it is stabilized in this lateral plane using a reaction wheel. This is one example. Let me show you other example, very old. 1924, so you have this 
uh, monorail, it's like a tramway, but he has just one rail. So it's a uh, monorail and it has two reaction wheels inside to stabilize the motion in the lateral plane. We have another example also, this one. You know Ford, it's a car manufacturer. It's an American car manufacturer. Ford, so they, they, they have not produced this to be commercialized, pay attention. It was just a prototype, but a real prototype. So it's a car with only two wheels and inside they have inertia wheels to stabilize the car. But they didn't, they never commercialized, it was just a prototype. But recently we can find new concepts, it's the same concept here in this car. 2016 you can find this car, it's new and it's also stabilized using the inertia wheel. So the idea of using an inertia wheel or reaction wheel, it's very old and it's present in different kind of systems. Let me show you other example that use this inertia wheel or we call it also a gyro stabilizer. A gyro stabilizer is an, a reaction wheel that, in, is be, that is used to stabilize a system. These examples, normally for those who uh, are learning about control, we can find them very easily for the classrooms for, to do the, to the lab courses of the application of the multi control. So you can have this kind of system which is also stabilized by the inertia wheel. We can find the cubely that they have shown you in the video. We can find other examples in marine robotics, so in some boats, underwater vehicles, so we can use inside the vehicle an inertia wheel to stabilize the system. We can have other examples in aerospace also. In this case here, you can use an inertia wheel to stabilize the camera, for instance. And we can find also the example of satellite. So the satellites mainly use inside inertia wheels to stabilize the angles of the satellite. So all these are examples of underactuated mechanical systems <laughs> stabilized by inertia wheels that use this reaction wheel to stabilize the system. Another example, and also it's a very famous example. So they have designed two kinds of robots, a boy and a girl. It's more, uh, the name is Moruta boy, boy robot or girl robot. And the concept is the same. So they use an inertia wheel here to stabilize the system in this plane. In the lateral plane. And as you can see, it's very stable. Since when the robot has tendency to move in this direction, so the, iner the reaction wheel will turn like that to compensate this torque. And if it is in this side, it's the inverse. So this is an example of a system which is using uh, inertia wheel to be stabilized. Now, let me, let me present you our experimental platform. So as I said, it's a system that uses the reaction wheel and it is the inertia wheel inverted pendulum. As you can see here, the main components of the mechanical part. So what we have, we have the body of the inverted pendulum. We have two joints, the passive articulation of the joint, and also we have the active joint. The active joint is inertia wheel, and we have motor to control this rotation of the inertia wheel. And then we have to measure the two degrees of freedom. The two degrees of freedom are the angle with the, with the vertical and the angle of the inertia wheel. So to measure the inertia, the inertia wheel angle, the motor is equipped, it's from Maxon, and it is equipped with an encoder, so you can measure the angle. To measure the angle with the vertical, as you can see, we have an inclinometer here, and this inclinometer is used to measure the angle with the vertical. So we can measure both degrees of freedom, the joint, the passive joint angle and the reaction wheel angle. Now, how it works? So this system, as I said, two degrees of freedom, one actuator, how it works. Let me explain the principle here. You can represent the system by this figure. So you can see here a joint. Here there is no actuator, it's passive joint. And there, the reaction wheel, it's an active joint. There is a motor. Now, if you look at the system at any position, what are the forces and the torques applied on the system? At, that, at this position, we have the gravity, F. F is the gravity. That, that's it, that the, the gravity F will generate this torque, MF0 or MFO. So it's a torque in this direction. And the, the reaction wheel is actuated. So you have U. U is the torque generated by the motor that is actuated the inertia wheel. If we control the reaction wheel, we can generate indirectly a torque here. And if the torque, this torque, is, is greater than the sum of 
this, tor uh, this, this torque is greater than this torque, it means that we can move in this direction. If this torque is less than this one, we, it means that we can move in this direction. So this is just to explain that by controlling the, the velocity and the acceleration of the wheel, we can modify the value of this torque and we can control the angle with the vertical. This is the idea. So the control input is coming from, mo from the motor of the inertia wheel and we can see its effect on this joint which is not actuated. So this is the idea. And now we have to find a way to control this acceleration of the wheel to get this to necessary torque. This is the idea. The Howell experimental platform is here. Here we have seen the, the mechanical part. Here is the electronic part. It's very cl classic, the computer, the power supply, the driver, and so on. Uh, the motor is here, we can see the encoder to measure the angle and the inclinometer to measure the angle with respect to the vertical of the pendulum. And uh, actually, let me uh, introduce the two problems. And let's see, let me start with the problem of the stabilization. So in automatic control, we have, mm, we have different kind of objectivity. If you want to control a system, we can do regulation, we can do stabilization, we can do tracking. What is the difference between regulation and tracking? Regulation, it means that what? So, the regulation, it means that the reference is constant. You want to control something, and the desired value is constant. This is the regulation. The tracking, the tracking is different. It means that the desired value, it's not constant. It's time varying. It can be a trajectory to follow. And one typical example in robotics, you have a robot, you want to go from one point A to one point B, B, you have to follow a trajectory, and which is not constant, which is varying. This is tracking. Now, what is the difference between uh, regulation and stabilization? The same? It's the same? So regulation and stabilization, it's the same. The only difference is that stabilization is a, a, a special case of regulation. Regulation is like a constant, but any value, which is different from zero. And the stabilization, it should be equal to zero. This is the difference. Actually, so for the case of our system, so we suppose that initially the system is in this position, and we try to control the system to get to the upright position. So it means we want to stabilize the system. The angle here with respect to the vertical should be equal to zero. So this is the problem of stabilization. So we have to find the control input to bring the system from any initial condition to this desired condition around zero. To resolve this problem, we have proposed different control schemes. Here we have different examples, and we have applied them for different conditions. Actually, we have, uh, I will show you the results of this, the control in red, predictive control. As you know, predictive control is one of uh, robust controllers, and we will, we will validate this control in nominal case, External disturbance, spectral, persistent disturbance, and both. Let me show you the obtained results. So the experimental results are here. This is the nominal case. So we suppose that initially we, the pendulum is in this position, and we try to control it to the upright position. This is the idea. And why we try to control it in this position? If you look to this system, it has two equilibriums. Do you know what is an equilibrium? What is an equilibrium in a system? The inverted pendulum has how many equilibrium points? One, two, nine, which are down and up. The, which one is a stable equilibrium point? There is one which is stable and the other one is unstable. Stable is here and unstable is here. So the inverted pendulum has two equilibrium points. Stable and stable. Stable because if you move it, it goes back to the, this value. And stable, if you move it, it goes away. Here it's the same, and the idea we want to stabilize to the unstable, and it's more challenging to stabilize, for sure, the system to the unstable one. Because for the stable, it's easy, you go there, and even if you have a disturbance, it will go back. But the, the most challenging is to go here and to stay. If you disturb, you have to stay. This is the idea. And this is what we want to do. As you can see here, this is the result. Theta one is the angle of, with respect to the vertical of the pendulum. Theta two dot is the inertia wheel, the reaction with speed. U is the control input, and 
d theta 1 it's the speed the velocity with respect to the vertical of the angle of the pendulum this is the, tor the torque that is generated by the motor which is actuated the inertial wheel so this is the nominal case let me show you v2 and stand so it's we go from some initial condition and we try to get it to the upright position and this is the result look this is the initial position as you can see the inertial wheel is accelerating to get the system to the upright position. And the idea is to have the pendulum angle around the vertical, but pay attention, we have also to pay, pay attention about the stability of the inertial wheel. And as you can see, we can get to the upright position with precision. So this is the first scenario, the nominal case. So we have no external disturbances, no torques that disturb the system. We didn't modify the parameters of the system. So this is the nominal case. Second scenario. In this scenario, the idea is to repeat the same thing. The only thing that we will modify, we will try to add persistent disturbance. It means that disturbance which is all the time present. How to introduce here this? We have just attached a small mass on the body of the pendulum. If you would attach it, it will generate around this point a torque, which is all the time present. And you will see how the system is compensating for this torque. So this is the curves. As you can see, we stabilize around zero. The speed of the inertia wheel here, it's not exactly zero, but oscill oscillates around zero. The speed of the pendulum, and here is the control input. This is the torque generated by the motor of the inertia wheel. Now, let me show you the video to see how the system behaves. Look. What you can observe here, you can observe the disturbance. This is the small mass that generates the torque here on the passive joint. But look to the inertia wheel. What is the difference with respect to the previous one? The previous one, when you arrive to the vertical, it stops rotating. But here, it continues rotating. Why? Because there is a disturbance which is all the time present, and the inertia wheel should continue rotating to compensate it. This is why the inertia wheel continues rotating. So this is the second scenario, the case of uh, persistent disturbance rejection. So as you can see, since the pendulum stays around the vertical, it means that it, the controller was able to reject this disturbance. This is the second scenario. Let me introduce now the third scenario. In the third one, we try to disturb the system, but it's not persistent. So from time to time, we push the system. We apply a force or a torque like that, and you see the behavior. So this is the result. As you can see from the curves, you can see the effect of the disturbance. Look here, it's a disturbance, another one, another one, another one. And you can see the effect of this disturbance on all the curves. I mean the position, the speed, the speed of the inertia wheel, and the control input. So the control input, it means that the controller, when you apply a disturbance, a torque or a force, it will modify the angle, and the controller will detect that there is an error in the angle. What he will do? The controller should increase the control input, the torque, to compensate this disturbance. Let me show the video now to understand better. We go from the initial position, then we get to the upright position. Look now to the disturbances. We will see, look. And look also the behavior. As soon as you push, the controller will increase the speed or the acceleration of the inertia wheel to compensate for this torque. Look. So this can show clearly so that the controller is able to reject this external disturbance and to stabilize the system around this desired verti uh, vertical position which is unstable equilibrium point. Last scenario now, what we did, we tried to combine both. So persistent disturbance and functional disturbance. And the result is the following. So we can see the effect of both disturbances. Here, for instance, the inertia will continue to uh, have uh, um, have a rotation which is around 500, uh, 500 uh, uh, radian per second. So uh, rotating around it means that we have persistent disturbance. And the factual disturbances, you can see them here. So through these curves, we, have, we can see the instance where we have disturbed the system. Now let me show the video to see better. We accelerate, we get to the vertical position. The inertia wheel is continuing rotating to compensate the effect of this disturbance. Look, and when we add this the other disturbance, 
we can see also the effect how the reaction will try to compensate both. So the persistence and eventual external disturbance. And this also shows that the controller is robust towards these external disturbances, both of them. Pay attention, here it, uh, as you can see it works fine. But if you disturb your system with a big disturbance, we cannot compensate this external disturbance. Why? Because the inertia wheel, I mean the compensation is coming from the inertia wheel. And initially it's a physical system. It's a motor, an inertia, a reaction wheel. And the motor has a maximum. So it has a maximum torque, it generates, for instance, 10 plus 10 plus minus 10 newton meter. So if you disturb with a big disturbance that needs 30 newton meter, no, it's not possible. So pay attention, this is true and this is working fine within the, the physical limits of your actuator that is used here, mode. Nice. Now let me introduce the second pro control problem. Actually, in the previous one, I said that the system has two equilibrium points, stable and stable, and the idea is to go from some initial condition to the unstable equilibrium point, and we want to stay there. Now, the idea is to do what we call the limit cycle generation. What is limit cycle? Limit cycle, physically, if you have something, you have a signal, which is, you have two signals, x1 and x2, and both they are periodic, okay? So if you plot x1 with respect to t, you have something periodic. x2 uh, with respect to t, fine, it's periodic. If you plot x1 depending on x2, so you remove the time, you obtain the phase portrait, and in the phase portrait, it's a closed form loop, it's like a loop, okay? You go from point, and you come back to the same point, and you repeat this motion. This is a limit cycle. This is a limit cycle. Now the idea in our system is to generate a stable. Pay attention, your limit cycle, if it's unstable, you start on the limit cycle and you go away. Now the idea in our case is to go to a stable limit cycle so you stay around this periodic motion. And this is the idea. The idea we suppose that initially we are here at this initial position and we try to generate these oscillations on both degrees of freedom, so on the inertia wheel and on the pendulum. What is this means? It means that we want to do something which is periodic. We go from this and we try to repeat this. Previously, we go from this and we start like, we stay here, we stop. But here we want to do periodic motion. This is the idea of uh, stabilization, sorry, of uh, limit cycle generation. But we have also to pay attention about the internal dynamics of the system, which is unstable. So we have to prove that both degrees of freedom are stable. We propose two control solutions. You know, if you design a controller to track some reference trajectories on the actuated degree only, and you don't, you don't add anything else, the system is automatically is inside and it will diverge. I mean, if you do just this, you have some reference trajectories, you do uh, feedback linearization, partial because it's under actuated, and by PID, and you control without this optimization. If you do this, you can never guarantee that you stabilize, that your system is stable. Because you will do this periodic motion, but you have divergence in the other degree of freedom. It will go, go, go away, away. So in our case, we try to do as a parameter in the trajectories, and we can use this through an optimization. And the optimization, we try to reduce the distance between the desired value and the actual value of the speed of the inertia wheel. So, and we have used also the same idea in another controller, uh, which I will sh show later on. And now we, we add another part here for the disturbances. So if you want to uh, reject an external disturbance, what we did is an estimator here. So it will estimate the disturbance and we compensate it in the controller. So this is the first control input, the uh, sorry, the first control solution. The second control solution is very close to this one. It's the same principle. We have reference trajectories, we have the tracking uh, controller, and we have first closed loop, and here we have the second controller. It means what? It means that we have used first controller to track the reference trajectories, and a second controller that will tune the parameters of the trajectory. So you do a parameterized trajectory, and the P parameter is, used, is, is computed using another controller. And in this case, we have used, I don't know if you know this controller, model-free control. It's called also intelligence PID. So 
to stabilize our system to generate this stable limit cycle, so we used we propose to use two controllers as this uh, this control scheme is illustrated here. Now let me show you the obtained results. And actually, I will show you some simulations, and I will show you also the experiments. The first scenario is the nominal case. So we try to track some periodic trajectory, as you can see here in red. Here it's the speed, and the, uh, here it's the, the convergence to the uh, limit cycle. This is the speed of the inertia wheel. It's periodic, and the most important is here, where you can see the limit cycle. As I said, here if you plot theta one dot in respect to theta one, it means that x two in function of x one. Look, this is the initial condition, and we converge to a periodic motion, a limit cycle, which is stable. And here it is just the control input, and this is the P, the parameter that is to be tuned, the P of this trajectory, it's here. It's controlled, it's computed by a second control, or the optimization. Now, how it, what happened on the real system? So this is simulation, as you can see, very nice. Look to the experiment. It's also very nice, but it's different. We can see the effect of the noise. Look, we have the noise here. We have the noise here, we have the noise here. And we obtain the same result, so a convergence to these periodic trajectories. We can see the convergence to the limit cycle. Uh, and we can see the speed of the inertia wheel. The parameter P is here. So the previous case, if you have seen, look, the parameter, it's easy to get a, uh, a constant value. But here it's varying, because we are on a real system and we have to retune it at each time to compensate for the instability. Now I will show you a, uh, a second scenario, also the same simulation and experiment, and we want to do the disturbance rejection, as the previous case. Here we can see the effects of the disturbance, here, 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 here. For all the, uh, all the curves, we can see the effects of the disturbance. We can see that when the system is disturbed, it goes back to the desired value. As you can see here, 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 here also. We converge here. This is disturbance, and it goes back. And also the control input through the reaction wheel, the torque supplied to the reaction wheel. The same scenario in experiments is here. And here you applied two disturbances. First one, it was around 15 seconds, and the third one, it was around 33 seconds. You can see so the effects of the disturbance on all the curves, on the parameter, here we have big variation here and here, because we have to compensate for this external disturbance. And we can see also that we are converging to the limit cycle, and we can see the effects of both disturbances. So we are on the limit cycle, we get away, and we go back. We disturb, we go away, and we go back. Nice. And now the persistent disturbance. As the previous case, we try to add this small mass to generate this uh, disturbing torque, which is all the time present, persistent. And we can see the convergence here. We converge. We have here the tracking of trajectories. We have the control input and also the parameter that should be used to control the, the internal dynamics. Now the same thing in experiments. You can see the curves, the noise, as you can see the effect of this disturbance and also the result. Now, so the physical result is here. This is the initial condition, and we try to do the motion. As you can see first, we are oscillating. So it's periodic, and it, as you can see, the inertia showing is changing the, sun, the direction of rotation. So actually, we try to disturb, we apply this disturbance, and as you can see, the reaction wheel, how it works to compensate for this external disturbance. And we see, so continuing here the control to generate this periodic motion. And as you can see, both degrees of freedom is stable. So the inertia wheel and the angle of the bundle. And now, a last scenario where we see the persistent disturbance rejection. So we add this value of this mass that we generate the torque. And we will see also how we can generate this periodic motion. As you can see, this is the mass, and the inertia wheel is rotating while compensating this uh, persistent external disturbance. So all these scenarios were used to show the effective of the proposed controllers and how it works and how the controller is able to reject this external disturbances. Now we remove 
the persistent disturbance. And as you can see, the inertia will change its rotation because we have no external turbulence. And through the sound, you can detect this. There is a difference between before and now. So this is the, the last video. And now let me conclude the presentation. So today I try to introduce this problem of control of and actuated mechanical systems. So to summarize, uh, these systems are systems which are characterized by less control inputs or motors or actuators than the business freedom. We are interested in two uh, scenarios, stabilization and limit cycle duration. So when we deal with this control problem, we have different problems or different challenges like the high the linear dynamic, the coupling between the actuator and non-actuated degrees of freedom, and the non-minimum phase, which uh, is also difficult to be uh, managed when we design a controller. So for the stabilization, we have proposed different controllers, and I show you the mud predictive control. For the limit cycle generation, we have proposed two controllers. The structure is mainly the same, but the components of the structure, in the first one, we have used an optimization. In the second one, we have used a GL, uh, two model-free controllers, and we have validated through different scenarios in simulations and also in real-time experiments to show the effectiveness and the robustness of the proposed controller. And to finish out the previous uh, lectures, I give you the link to my web page. If you are interested in the papers, you can download them on this uh, website, ResearchGate. And uh, also, if you want to see other videos on all the research activities I'm working on, so you can, uh, you can subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. So um, you have many videos about control of uh, robots. My email address if you have any questions. And I finish by, thank you very much for your attention. Someone a question? Someone? Yes, please. Very good question. So the question is about uh, not the stabilization, but the last case where we did the limit cycle generation, like this, for instance, a real application. So it's a very good application, a very good question. To answer this question, I will go back to the beginning. You will see one of the systems which is underactuated, and in this system we need periodic trajectories. And they will show you, show you how we can use what we propose on this system. Here, look, this is an example. So this is a working robot, it's a biped robot that can work like that. So this system is underactuated. And this system, if you want to generate the working, as I said yesterday, you have to generate the reference static trees. And the reference static trees mainly they are periodic. So the uh, idea of limit cycle generation can be exactly applied in this case. So to create some periodic trajectory to do the working and why you guarantee the stability of convergence around these different trajectories. So this is, can be a real application. Okay, other questions? Other questions or comments? Yes, please. Which is the relationship between inertial Body. Ah, very nice question also. Let me go back. Uh, uh, no, perhaps after. After, after. Here. Here I can explain. What is the, the question is, what is the relation between the inertia wheel and the body? You know, if you have an inertia wheel, and the inertia wheel is rotating, if you, if, uh, you do this rotation of the inertia wheel, mechanically, this can be represented as, as two forces. One force which is situated here, uh, suppose that we rotate in like that. So we have one force here down, it means here, which will be in this direction, row like that, and the up position, in the up position, the other direction. It's like you have two forces. And if you compute the torques of these two forces, one torque is uh, in this direction, the other torque in the other direction. But the values of these torques are not the same. You know why? 
because the distance between this point and here is not the same between this point and the up position. So if the same force, F plus, F plus, but the distance is not the same. So it means the torque one is more than the other one. So the torque in this case, the up uh, torque, about the up force, is more than the other one. So this can, be, can have an effect here on the body. So if you can have this, so you can control the angle of the body of the pendulum using this torque. So this is the, the how, I mean, we transmit from the rotation of the wheel to here, to the body of the pendulum. Um, uh, if you decide to uh, use a wheel small or big, yeah. what, what uh, is happening with that? Okay, what, uh, whatever the, the dimension of the wheel, we have all the time the difference between the two torques, about the two forces, because it's the same force, one is like that, one is like that, but the rotation point is here, so the distance is not the same. So now if you increase the dimension of the wheel, you will increase this effect. So it means if you have a bigger wheel, you have more effect on the, on the body of the pendulum. This is why on uh, some of the examples you can see the wheel as a big one and inside it is empty. Okay? Yes, please. Please uh, repeat. So the size of the wheel, it affects the effect? Yes, it has an effect. The size of the wheel, it has an effect because if you increase the size of the wheel, you can increase the torque that is wheel applied here. Here we have no actuator, so it's just coming from the effect of the wheel. So if you increase, you increase the effect. You reduce the size, region. but pay attention, it's not only the size because we have the inertia also. So if you may put a small wheel with a plastic, which is very not very heavy, so it has not the same effect as, as an inertia wheel which is made of metal, you understand? So one of the parameters can be the size, diameter, but we can have other parameters also like the inertia and the mass. So which one is better? Ah, we have to do a study to define which one is the better, but I think uh, uh, we can if you increase, it's better. But pay attention, the problem is the motor. So the motor here, look, this is the motor. Oops. This is the motor that actuates the inertia wheel. So if you put a big one, perhaps the motor will not be able to do a big acceleration or to rotate this carefully. This is the problem. But otherwise, if you have, uh, I mean, a powerful motor, you can increase. And why? If you increase, you can improve. Other questions or comments or yes, please. Okay, uh, pay attention, when I said yesterday hybrid, I said that in general, if we say the state of the art, we design for each working phase a controller, and the resulting whole system is hybrid. But pay attention, in our case yesterday, what I present is one continuous controller, which is applied to the system, but the system is hybrid. Hybrid, it means that it's continuous, we have impact, discontinuity, and continuous. This is what I mean by hybrid. And the control that we have proposed, I call it hybrid. It's not hybrid in the time. Hybrid, it means it uses uh, two things. It uses kinematic and dynamic. This is what means hybrid. Hybrid is a combination of kinematic and dynamic. Now, actually, for the working, uh, for the biped working that I, to answer the, the question of the students, I talk it about the periodic motion. So, since the robot, the working robot is uh, underactuated, and we need to do work in create periodic trajectories, we can use this uh, second controller to create this. Now, on the real system, we can use any control you want. The only thing we have just to pay attention about the study. So actually, for the underactuated systems, if you generate here really periodic motion and you don't worry about the other one, you cannot guarantee the stability. So you have to generate something to track the rate of whatever the control is. Mother predictive control or PID or any control, no problem. When you create this tracking, you have to think about a way how you can deal with the other degree of freedom. And in our case here, so the idea that I have proposed, it was, uh, uh, no, it's after. The idea, it was here. 
Yes, here. Here or here, here whatever. So here we have a controller. So we were obliged to add another controller. It will not control directly something. I mean, it will not control a degree of freedom. It will generate a parameter of the trajectory. So it will, it will just modify the reference trajectory that is tracked by the other controller. And it's a second controller. If you don't add this, you cannot guarantee the stability. This is the problem. Okay, any other questions or remarks? Yes, please. Uh, if the wheel is more big, uh, the way affect the system? Sorry? The wheel is bigger, okay? The, the way affect the system? Ah, for sure. For sure, the effect of the inertia wheel is important, and as I said, uh, let me go back here. Yes, uh, or even whatever the... <coughs> yes, here. Here, uh, if you want to do a periodic motion, I said that the, the rotation wheel will generate a torque here. It will generate two torques. And one torque in one direction, the other torque in the other direction. If you increase the size, the mass, the inertia of, the, of, the, of this wheel, it means that the torques that you will generate here, they will be bigger. If they are bigger, you will have better effect on the angle of the pendulum, of the body of the pendulum. But the only thing, as I said before, uh, you have to pay attention about your system because the inertia, will, if it's bigger, it's okay. But the problem is the motor, which is rotating the inertia wheel, is able to generate this needed torque? This is the question. If it's able to generate it, that's fine. Otherwise, you have to reduce the size. Or to put a motor which is bigger. This is the idea. But to answer the question, yes, if you increase the size, the inertia, the mass of, the, of this reaction wheel, the effect will change. Other questions? Yes? Yes. Okay, very good question. Very good question. Let me, let me go back to the... So the system is here. Okay. So it's here. Uh, you know, when we designed this system, first, the idea was to use this system for the stabilization of a walking. So we have another walking robot. And we want to put this on the hip of the robot to stabilize the system. This is why we have chosen approximately this, uh, this form. Now, uh, inside here, you have, you have a, a hole, two holes. The upper hole is to, to fix the uh, inclinometer, the, actual, the sensor to measure the angle of, uh, with respect to the vertical. And the second hole is just to reduce the mass uh, of uh, the inertia of the body. That's all. But it's not, you can, you can change the, I mean, the, the, whole, the form of the whole inside. Uh, and the, and the, the, the outside form, it's, la, it's regarding the application. You want to use this on a working rock. Uh, and now, from this to this, this is, pay attention, it's just a simplification of the, of the system. So, from this point to this point, it's from the passive joint to the active joint. And all the body, we represent it by this. This. But for me, uh, it's an approximation. It's uh, just a simplification. It's not uh, exactly the same. But the, to show the mechanical principle of, wo of working, how it works, so we use this. But for sure, it's different. Uh, this is ah. <laughs> no, finally, we didn't go until the final stage, so we didn't try it on the working robot. So we continue working only on the fundamental level. Yes. Any other questions or remarks or comments? Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, the Polytechnic University of Tulancingo grants the following acknowledgement to PhD Ahmed Somori for having given the lecture Control of Underactuated Mechanical System from Challenges to Some Solutions in the framework of the 10th International Research Congress from the UPT. Tulancingo de Bravo, primary 15, 2018, Arturo Kilborja, rector. Tomorrow, PhD Ahmed, he will give his last lecture 
about advanced control of wearable robotic exoskeleton, and also I had a message for all of us. All the slides from the previous lecture, including tomorrow, today and tomorrow, will be available to the UPT website coming soon. <laughs> Bueno, quien no me entendió, mañana el doctor Amel va a dar su última. <risa> mañana el doctor Amel va a dar su última conferencia, conferencia acerca de ro trajes robóticos de su esqueleto, control avanzado. De igual manera, todas las diapositivas, en este caso todas las presentaciones que ocupó para sus conferencias, van a estar disponibles próximamente en la página de la escuela. ¿Cuándo? No sé, pero no tienen que estar. <risa> Universidad Politécnica de Tulancingo. Líderes construyendo su futuro.